So mm -hmm. I'm delighted to present our keynote speaker, Dr. Amy Arnston from Yale University. Um, she studies the molecular regulation of higher cortical circuits, identifying changes with stress and age that cause cognitive deficits and increase risk of disorders, such as schizophrenia and Al Alzheimer's disease. Without further ado, Professor Arnston. Thank you so much and welcome everybody and good morning in California. Uh, as you just heard, I study the effects of stress on prefrontal cortical function, something very timely uh, for this past year and very relevant uh, to your uh, conference topic today. Before I go on, I wanted to say that I have several um, YouTube videos at the Yale Medical School YouTube channel, including one on how stress affects the brain. If you go to this channel and then search uh, my last name, uh, you should be able to find a variety of them there, including this one, if you're wanting to learn more. It's so important that we learn how to overcome adversity and be our best selves. And uh, studying the prefrontal cortex is especially pertinent to this goal because these are the circuits that help us overcome adversity. But sadly, they are also the circuits that are especially vulnerable to uncontrollable stress. So particularly helpful to learn about what makes these circuits thrive and what takes them out offline during stress. And as many of uh, you might know, uh, the prefrontal cortex observes many of our highest order functions. And we're seeing that the molecular changes that alter brain function during stress, um, um, understanding these, and then we can uh, help to understand why prefrontal cortex can go offline. And that can help us forgive ourselves and provide resilience. It also illuminates the etiology of several cognitive disorders, as we'll see. So it has medical benefit as well as personal. So as those of you interested in cognitive neuroscience might know, the prefrontal cortex is really remarkable. It has this ability to sustain neural activity in the absence of sensory stimulation. And that is the foundation of abstract thought. So prefrontal has a variety of higher order functions, working memory, our mental sketch pad, abstract reasoning, and in humans, language production. And what we often call the executive functions, top-down regulation of thought and attention, action and emotion, what some call cognitive control, high order decision making, planning and organization, and then so-called metacognitive abilities like remembering to remember, insight and judgment about ourselves and others, and theory of mind, being able to understand what other people are thinking. And the prefrontal cortex, although amongst the most recently evolved parts of the brain, um, has a at least rough topography in multiple directions, where we see simpler representations, uh, more caudal, so um, backwards, <laughs> Uh, and representations of, abs of representations, the most abstract uh, things, more rostral. And this is why insight and judgment, um, which are uh, evaluating our own thoughts, being localized more rostrally. There's also topography in the dorsal lateral to ventral medial domains, where the dorsal and lateral surfaces in general represent our external world and the ventral and medial represent our internal world, such as uh, taste and smell coming together to form flavor and reward values being dynamically represented there. What we've been learning is that the prefrontal cortex has unique molecular needs and it is highly dependent on arousal state. And it has this very narrow inverted U relationship between arousal 
and prefrontal cognitive abilities, where we have optimal functions when we're alert, safe, and interested, but even quite mild stress, if we feel out of control, impairs prefrontal function. And same when we are fatigued. And prefrontal absolutely offline when we are unconscious in deep sleep. And we've speculated that when people dissociate with severe stress, it may be because there is so much uh, prefrontal uh, offline. Now, this can be seen in animals where we discovered a lot of it, but also you can see it in humans. For example, an uncontrollable stressor reduces the prefrontal uh, bold response and it impairs working memory in animals and humans. And if anybody's interested, uh, here are um, a re review and this um, paper from which these data are taken from. Now, what as Pat Goldman Rakish discovered, and I'll be showing you more of this, it is layer three of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that is particularly important for generating mental representations, especially in this region of visual space. And these circuits are highly dependent on the arousal modulators. So layer three pyramidal cells have extensive recurrent connections to be able to excite each other to keep the information in mind without any sensory stimulation. They also have extensive connections with cortical and subcortical regions for retrieving or generating mental representations and for top-down control of attention, action, and emotion. And it is these layer three circuits that expand most uh, in brain evolution. So if we look just across primates and we compare the primary visual cortex, um, secondary cortex V2, and then dorsolateral prefrontal, and we look baboon, marmoset, rhesus to human, you see this enormous increase in the number of spines and connections in the dorsolateral prefrontal with the rhesus monkey most similar to human. Whereas in primary visual cortex, they're all about the same. And within the rhesus monkey, if you compare primary visual V1 uh, to dorsolateral prefrontal layer three, look at the difference in spine density. It's more than uh, twice. And so this is a reflection of the much greater connectivity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and these incredible connections that create thought. These are also the spines and dendrites most affected in schizophrenia. So the amazing work of David Lewis's lab showing that deep layer three, which is where these microcircuits reside, is the focal point for spine and dendrite loss in schizophrenia with less even in superficial parts of three, and if anything, in deeper layers, uh, slightly more uh, numbers of spines. And V1 also not significant. So it makes sense that a cognitive disorder, especially one with thought disorder, as one of the most prominent symptoms, would have deficits in the very layers that create thought. Layer three of prefrontal is also a focus of degeneration in Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, there are neurofibrillary tangles, and amyloid plaques, and it is the tangles, tau pathology, um, that correlates better with symptoms of dementia. And as we'll see, layer three um, of dorsolateral prefrontal, these pyramidal cells are particularly vulnerable to acquiring tangles and degenerating. In contrast, there's very few uh, tangles in Alzheimer's disease in primary visual cortex here now, uh, Broadman's area 17, it's others, it, that's its other name. And only about an average of one tangle, even at end stage disease. So even though there's pyramidal cells in layer three in both of these cortical areas, one so vulnerable and one so resilient. So we've been wanting to figure out what makes these in dorsolateral so vulnerable. And what we're finding is that they're regulated at the molecular level in a manner that is fundamentally different from classic search circuits such as those in V1. 
And what we're finding is that prefrontal layer three synapses have magnified calcium signaling in spines right near the glutamate synapse. We call this the genie in the bottle. But what we're seeing is feed forward cyclic AMP calcium signaling. And I'll show you this in more depth in a little bit, but it's where cyclic AMP through PKA can fo phosphorylate a variety of calcium channels to increase calcium release, which in turn generates more cyclic AMP. And so we have feed forward signaling. And we think that this functions to depolarize the synaptic membrane to support the sustained neuronal firing that's needed without any bottom-up sensory stimulation. And we see this evidence of cyclic AMP magnification of NMDA receptors, um, and especially those with NR2B subunits, which close very slowly and thus allow in lots of calcium. L-type voltage-gated calcium channels that let calcium in from outside the cell and internal calcium release, which is what we see here with the ryanodine receptor as one of the calcium channels uh, that allows calcium out of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and into the cytosol of the neuron. We also see right near this molecular complex, a concentration of potassium channels that are opened by cyclic KMP and PKA. And this allows for dynamic changes in network strength that can shape the contents of these mental representations in working memory. So when the potassium channels open, that weakens the synaptic connectivity. And when they close, it strengthens it. So you can have what we call dynamic network connectivity. However, when you have very high levels of cyclic AMP calcium signaling, as occurs with uncontrollable stress, now you have large numbers of these potassium channels opening and that fully disconnects prefrontal neurons from their recurrent excitation and the neurons stop firing. The genie has escaped the bottle and prefrontal cortex is taken offline. At the same time, stress um, signaling through the catecholamines in particular, strengthens more primitive circuits in the amygdala, which does emotional responses, and the striatum, which does uh, emotional habits. So we rapidly switch from reflective prefrontal control to more reflexive, rapid acting, uh, primitive circuit control. And this can have survival value in many dangerous situations, like in modern day, if you're cut off on the highway, but it's harmful when we're needing our prefrontal cortex to respond appropriately, for example, to an invisible deadly virus like COVID. And I think we've gotten to see with the loss of prefrontal function in many people that they then expose themselves to dangers and, and pay a horrible price for it. What's also important is this signaling uh, nexus is a nexus for genetic and environmental insults related uh, to cognitive disorder, especially what we see is loss of regulation of these genie signaling pathways leads to pathology. This is um, related to a large number of disorders. Um, prefrontal dysfunction is basically uh, a part of any neuropsychiatric disorder. That's, I think, why we call it psychiatric. Today, I'll just briefly mention about schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease, two cognitive disorders that involve prefrontal dysfunction and which we can directly relate to changes in these molecular signaling pathways. So what we do in my uh, lab is um, compare the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to the primary sensory visual cortex 
And we've just begun also doing anatomical studies in entorhinal cortex, because this is um, the place in cortex where Alzheimer's disease first begins. And I'm not going to be presenting that data today other than to say we're seeing very um, a, a lot of similarities between entorhinal and prefrontal in terms of this magnified calcium signaling. So what do we do? Um, how we approach this is threefold. First of all, we do amino electron microscopy to localize protein interactions at the ultrastructural level. And we can see um, uh, molecules within nanometers of each other. It's really amazing. Physiology. We record for monkeys doing higher order cognitive tasks and why they're doing these tasks. We ionophorese, which means electrically sprinkle just a little bit of drug onto the neurons we're recording from to see how these focal changes in molecular signaling alter neuronal physiology, and especially the pattern of firing in relationship to higher cognitive operations. And finally, we do uh, behavioral studies where we look at how local or especially systemic drug administration affects cognition, such as working memory. And the main reason for this is the goal of our work is to identify potential treatments for cognitive disorders. We have already identified two, which are now in widespread use. And that feels um, really wonderful and I think is a validation of this approach. So let me start first um, by um, showing you our data about primary visual cortex. And what we see here is classic neurotransmission. So what the monkeys are doing is they fixate to initiate a trial and they're looking for this fixation point to suddenly dim. And when they do that, they release a bar for their favorite juice reward. And while they're um, fixating on this point, we flash bars of different orientations, light or dark, into the receptive field of the neuron we're recording from. So we can see how that neuron, um, when responding to its favorite visual stimulus, is altered by the drug treatments that we'd be doing. And this work was done in collaboration uh, with Jamie Mazur. And uh, what I'll be showing you evidence of is classic neurotransmission with a lot of amphoreceptors being really important, including, um, I think many of you might be aware that AMPA receptor stimulation is usually what is permissive for NMDA receptor actions, depolarizing the postsynaptic density to eject the magnesium out of the NMDA receptor pore. And that allows it to now, in response to glutamate, open to let in sodium and calcium. And uh, that then can mediate plasticity um, and also uh, general signaling. So I'll show you evidence um, that this is um, very much what's going on in V1. The other thing I'll be showing you is classic cyclic AMP signaling, where cyclic AMP related proteins are focused here in the presynaptic axon terminal um, surrounding the glutamate vesicles, where it's known that cyclic AMP PKA can, oops, sorry, can increase uh, transmitter release. And what we've uh, used as an index of cyclic AMP, which disappears itself very quickly, is the phosphodiesterase PD4A, which catabolizes cyclic AMP and is a uh, signal of where the cyclic AMP is localized. So let me show you uh, just a very brief amount of this data. Uh, so evidence for large amounts of AMPA receptor and actually lesser NMDA. So uh, this is the sensory evoked firing. 
And if we block AMPA receptors with even a really low dose of an AMPA receptor blocker, CNQX, we have a dramatic loss of firing that then recovers. And we can see that here. But if we do the same thing with NMDA receptors, including those with just the NR2B subunits, no effect. It takes really high doses of NMDA blockers to be able to reduce firing. So a great sensitivity and dependence on AMPA receptors. And I just, um, this makes sense because AMPA receptors open and close really quickly. If you're trying to encode a, a brief sensory event, you want something fast and accurate. And then our marker of uh, cyclic AMP, um, the phosphodiesterase PD4A, and we see it uh, mostly presynaptically surrounding these vesicles. And it's known that cyclic AMP PK signaling primes vesicles for release, so you'd get more glutamate in the synapse. And indeed, that's what we see. If we give a drug um, that activates protein kinase A, we get a dose-related increase in the neurons firing to the visual stimulus. So in summary, in V1, firing depends on AMPA receptors more than NMDA, and cyclic AMP-related signaling proteins appear to be positioned to strengthen synapses, increase glutamate release, and increase firing. So classic neurotransmission. What we see in prefrontal cortex is fundamentally different. And that makes sense because it has the opposite function. It's representing information such as visual space in the absence of sensory stimulation. And as we said before, this is the foundation of abstract thought. So the work I'm gonna show you now was that of um, the discoveries of Patricia Goldman Rakesh, who tragically died in 2003. And at the 10 year anniversary of her death, I wrote this review of her work, if anybody is interested. She and her husband, Pashko Rakesh, uh, created the journal Cerebral Cortex. And so that was the proper home for this review. So let me show you how she discovered the neural basis of visual spatial representation, the neural basis of working memory. So she had the monkeys doing this, what we call ocular motor delayed response task. In this task, what they do is fixate centrally to initiate a trial. And as they do that, a cue flashes on for just a half a second in one of these eight locations. They then have to keep fixating and remember that location over a delay period of many seconds until this fixation point goes off. And that's the signal to the monkey to move its eyes to the remembered direction for favorite juice reward. And then they can start another trial and the cue randomly uh, occurs at one of the, these eight locations. And now they must update the contents of working memory during the next delay period. And what Pat and her uh, collaborators found, especially Shintaro Funahashi, that the prefrontal cortex has these spatially tuned, what she called delay cells, where they can represent visual space in the absence of sensory stimulation. So here's a neuron representing 90 degrees. So this is the cue com coming on, the delay period, and the response. And each of these trials is when the cue had been at 90 degrees, whereas this is uh, how the neuron responds on when the cue is 45, zero, and so forth. And I think you can see this neuron fires on all the trials when the cue is at 90, but not, or very little, if it was um, at other directions. And so at the end of this delay period, if this neuron is firing, the brain knows, ah, the cue had been at 90 degrees, look left. Pat also showed these as a memory field of that neuron. And very importantly,
Um, people like Jackie Gottlieb have shown that this persistent firing can be maintained by prefrontal neurons despite distractors. Whereas if you're recording from the parietal association cortex, they get distracted by every distractor you show. They start firing to the distractor rather than keeping firing to the original goal. So this is an important part of what prefrontal can do and why working memory and attention are so closely aligned. So Pat worked out uh, the neural basis for this and she found these microcircuits in deep layer three with extensive recurrent excitation that allow a neuron to fire like this. So the persistent firing I'll show you is mediated by glutamate acting at NMDA synapses, especially those with NR2B uh, subunits, the ones that close slowly. Whereas the spatial tuning is refined by lateral inhibition from GABAergic intraneurons. So this helps keep the information held in working memory very clear because of course, if the neuron fired at everything, there'd be no information anymore. So uh, what we're finding is that this persistent firing, the recurrent excitation uh, is powerfully regulated at the molecular level in this way that's very unique. And this allows us to coordinate our cognitive state with our arousal state and is the basis of that inverted view. So let me show you some of our data um, that supports what I've been telling you. So first of all, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in layer three has unusual neurotransmission. In contrast to B1, great dependence on NMDA receptors, including those with NR2B subunits that let in very large amounts of calcium. And I'll show you remarkably little dependence on AMPA receptors. And instead these permissive excitatory effects being done by acetylcholine, something which is only released during waking and not deep sleep. So let me show you some of the evidence for this. First of all, that these NMDA receptors with the NR2B subunits are exclusively within the synapse, not extrasynaptic as they often are at classic synapses. And this is the work of John Morrison who collaborated with us for that. And if we uh, ionophorese NMDA receptor blockers onto the neuron, including as in this case, um, one that is selective for these NMDAs with NR2B subunits, you can see this complete loss of representation. The information is gone. Uh, you can see that with NR2A, um, more typical NMDA receptors as well. So both of them are contributing. And the reliance on the NR2B is really in interesting because the expression of this receptor in human cortex uh, increases across the cortical hierarchy with very little in V1 and much more in dorsolateral prefrontal. And it also increases across primate evolution. So uh, if you look in prefrontal, there's uh, the least in marmoset, more in macaque, and the most in human. So this mechanism seems to be very much related to the evolution of cortex involved with higher cognition. In contrast to NMDA, the role <coughs> of AMPA receptors is surprisingly small. So this is the firing for the preferred direction for this neuron or this group of neurons, it's an average, um, compared to one of those seven non-preferred directions. In navy is the uh, firing under control conditions. With red, what happens with the NMDA and R2B blockade. Look what happens when we block AMPA receptors. Almost nothing. 
there's a small significant impairment in just this one part of the delay period, but uh, remarkably little. Uh, so uh, if we compare this to V1, it's the exact opposite. So V1 very dependent on AMPA uh, in prefrontal, very subtle and a huge dependence on NMDA. So what's relieving the magnesium block that allows us to have these NMDA actions if AMPA receptors aren't playing a big role? And the answer is acetylcholine. I'll show you the data for, for nicotinic alpha-7 receptors, but we've recently found that muscarinic M1 receptors contribute as well. So for example, the nicotinic alpha-7 receptors are right in the glutamate synapse, as well as uh, next to a cholinergic synapse, which is right on the other side of the small spine head. And nicotinic alpha-7 receptors flux both sodium and calcium. S similar to NMDA, they are ion channels themselves and so can very much depolarize um, the synaptic membrane. So if we block them, we get loss of firing. If we stimulate them with low doses, we get beautiful enhancement of firing that we can reverse again with the antagonist. But the permissive interaction with NMDA receptors we can see here, where NMDA itself excites these cells, of course, but if we first block alpha-7 receptors with this drug MLA, NMDA is no longer able to excite the cell. So that's evidence of permissive effects of cholinergic stimulation at alpha-7 receptors. So as acetylcholine is released during wakefulness, but not deep sleep, is this one of the bases for conscious thought? why we are unconscious during deep sleep when there is no acetylcholine release and this neuron can no longer excite this one. We also wonder if this is why almost all patients with schizophrenia smoke, that they are trying to, to strengthen the very synapses that we know are most affected in schizophrenia. So to summarize, in contrast to V1, where AMPA receptors predominate and are permissive, in prefrontal, it is NMDA receptors that are permissive, including and in an evolutionary way, those with um, NR2B subunits. And it is cholinergic arousal mechanisms that are permissive for NMDA neurotransmission. So now let's go on to this unusual neuromodulation because this is where we will see the effects of stress. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we see evidence of the molecular machinery to magnify calcium signaling near the synapse where cyclic GMP can increase calcium, which in turn increases cyclic GMP. And this we think uh, needed to sustain the persistent firing. But if there is sufficient cyclic AMPPK signaling to open these nearby potassium channels, it actually disconnects the synaptic connection and takes prefrontal offline very rapidly. And this being the basis for this narrow inverted U dose response with the arousal uh, systems. So we are finding three interacting courses of cal uh, sources of calcium in these layer three spines. Um, one I've already uh, told you about, these NMDA receptors and especially the NR2B that let in calcium and the nicotinic uh, alpha-7 as well. So uh, these receptors right in the synapse. The second we're just discovering now um, is voltage-gated calcium channels, such as CAV1.2, which is an L-type calcium channel. Um, and these are encoded by the CACNA1C gene, which is very much linked uh, to increased risk of mental disorders, and it's a gain-of-function mutation, interestingly. Um, and we can see these right here on the membrane, 
by the glutamate synapse. And this is the spine. And it's right next to what we call the spine apparatus here in pink. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum extends into the spine and elaborates. And this is what stores and releases calcium inside the cell. And the calcium comes out of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum through ryanodine receptors and IP3 receptors. And um, it's also known that CAV 1.2, this voltage-gated calcium channel, uh, can, through connections to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, calcium-mediated calcium release. So this calcium uh, further activates the release of calcium out of the ER. And we can see that these channels are indeed right next to uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in the spine. So we can see the physical evidence of that with EM. And cyclic AMP PK signaling increases calcium through all of these. It phosphorylates NMDA receptors to enhance calcium entry. It um, phosphorylates CAV 1.2 to increase calcium entry, and it can uh, phosphorylate and affect these calcium channels on the ER that also increases internal calcium release. So from all of these, we get enhanced calcium, which then can lead to increased cyclic AMP signaling and feed forward vicious cycles. So let me show you just a little of the evidence for the cyclic AMP um, that this indeed is happening there. So protein kinase A um, is anchored uh, by ACAP6, anchoring protein 6, and that's what keeps PKA right next to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And these gold particles are attached to antibodies that recognize ACAP6, and we see them, excuse me, all along the spine apparatus. So PKA all along there. And we also see receptors that drive cyclic AMP production. Um, the VIP receptor type 2, VPAC2, um, which um, is a stress receptor, PACAP acts at this. PACAP is a master stress signaling peptide that we're about to study. And dopamine D1 receptors uh, drive cyclic AMP signaling uh, here, and they are focused on the spine. So for example, here is um, dopamine D1 receptor right next to um, this axon terminal has the, um, the morphology of the dopamine terminal, whereas here, is the glutamate axon terminal. So this is the synapse in pink, the spine apparatus. So D1 receptors uh, right near where we would be generating cyclic AMP to cause calcium release. So we see them in this position. We also have these potassium channels on spines that open to weaken connectivity. And this is really important, uh, providing negative feedback to prevent seizures and to also dynamically coordinate neuronal connectivity with arousal state. And let me uh, tell you just a touch about those now. We have HCN channels that partner with slack potassium channels. Um, and these we can see concentrated on spines in prefrontal, but not in V1 often near D1 receptors, for example. And um, the open probability of these channels is increased by cyclic AMP. As I said, they partner with slack potassium channels to have these dynamic changes in connectivity and thus dynamic changes in mental representations. Um, interestingly, the HCN1 gene is a risk factor for schizophrenia and it's apparent gain of function. So these, uh, these channels would be opening more. 
The other channel that we see is KCNQ2, which is open by PKA. Um, if you have a mutation that doesn't allow PKA to open uh, KCNQ2, you have epilepsy. Uh, so um, that makes sense in this regard. And when we, uh, there are drugs where we can directly manipulate the open state of KCNQ. So if you open these channels, it reduces firing. And um, if you block them, it increases firing. I'm not showing you that there. But we can also see this by giving drugs such as what we did in V1 uh, to activate PKA and we get reduced firing uh, when we do this in prefrontal. So this is the exact opposite of what we see in V1. V1, these drugs increase firing. Here they are decreasing firing because of these channels uh, on these spines. So here we have our narrow inverted U dose response with too little calcium cyclic AMP signaling uh, we do not have enough depolarization of the synaptic membrane. There's a magnesium blockade and very little firing. Uh, under optimal conditions, we have depolarization of the synaptic membrane that can uh, sustain the firing, but we also have just enough negative feedback um, that we can have things um, both in, in control and flexible. But with stress, when we have too much uh, calcium cyclic AMP signaling, now we have too much potassium channel uh, opening, the loss of conductivity and the loss of firing. So we see this inverted U, for example, with dopamine D1 receptor firing. When we have too little, we have reduced firing under optimal conditions with small amounts, uh, lovely amounts of, uh, of firing for the preferred direction. But with high levels, as occurs during stress, we get a uh, dramatic loss of firing. We see the same thing with norepinephrine alpha-1, by the way, I'll be showing you uh, this later, that both dopamine and norepinephrine are, um, lead to loss of firing during stress. So in summary, uh, in contrast to V1, where high levels of cyclic AMP PK signaling increase firing, they decrease it in prefrontal through opening of nearby potassium channels. So contrasting neuromodulation. So with stress, we get a drive of this feed forward cyclic AMP um, calcium signaling with dopamine D1, as I was just showing you, and also with high levels of norepinephrine, which engage low affinity alpha-1 receptors and drive the calcium end of this. Um, they generate IP3, which stimulates the IP3 receptor to release calcium. And so you can enter this vicious cycle through both points. And with chronic stress, uh, norepinephrine uh, increases. You get more being made in the axons. Um, in some conditions, more alpha-1 receptors. We see evidence of more KCNQ. So this gets exaggerated, and you actually lose spines and dendrites. So this work has been done in rodents um, in medial prefrontal. But what you see is the loss of spines and dendrites in um, layer two, three of the medial prefrontal. Uh, we can protect against this by giving agents such as the PKC inhibitor, chalorethrin, or um, the alpha 2A agonist guanfacine. If you do that, uh, you maintain spines and you maintain cognition. And so the uh, spine density correlates with percent correct on a working memory task. So this is, uh, we think, especially important for um, treating chronic stress conditions such as PTSD. And it's known by uh, others, a lot of work again from John Morrison's lab, um, that you can recover from spine loss uh, if you have sustained periods without stress.
this plasticity is uh, lost or at least weakened uh, in aged rats, um, suggesting that it might take, hopefully with longer time, uh, they would recover. Um, but it, this is not, a re recovery really might require um, medication. And we see this in humans as well, where the greater the number of adversive life events, the um, lower the prefrontal uh, gray matter volume. So uh, something that can be seen in animals and humans as well, and deeply related to neuropsychiatric disorders. So luckily, there are mechanisms that regulate feed-forward calcium cyclic AMP signaling and allow these connections to be strengthened. And so I'm going to go through each of these in turn because these are intimately related to the etiology of cognitive disorders and also to strategies uh, for effective treatment. So um, in um, for example, genetic insults in schizophrenia uh, target many of these. So let's start with calbindin, and this one ends up being really related uh, to the etiology of Alzheimer's disease. So calbindin is in the cytosol where it binds ca um, calcium that is released from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum or that enters into the neuron. And so this can bind the calcium and keep it from its toxic actions when you have too much. And what we're seeing is that you lose calbindin um, with advancing age, and it's also been shown with early life stress. So both of these things then would predispose the neuron to atrophy and toxic calcium actions. Another important um, um, regulatory mechanism is norepinephrine actions at alpha 2A receptors. These receptors um, have high affinity for norepinephrine, so they get engaged under conditions where we're alert but feel safe, um, so um, modest amounts of norepinephrine release, and they inhibit the projection of cyclic AMP. We see these receptors concentrated on spines in prefrontal cortex, often right next to the HCN channels, so the basis for this cartoon, and sometimes in the spine neck. And physiologically, if we ionophorese guanfacine, which is the most selective drug available for alpha-2A receptors. It stimulates these receptors without stimulating the other noradrenergic receptors, and we get a lovely enhancement of uh, the delay-related firing. We also, when we give it systemically, see improved working memory. We see reduced distraction and better impulse control. All of these studies uh, done in monkeys, but you can also see some in rodents themselves. And it was um, based on this work that guanfacine uh, was then developed for treating prefrontal cognitive disorders in humans under the brand name Intunov uh, because it's an extended release formulation for younger individuals who metabolize guanfacine very quickly. And this is a recent review if you're interested in its clinical use. And I wrote this review on how we discovered this and developed it and why it has uh, it, remarkable so many women neuroscientists involved in this discovery. And recent work has shown that guanfacine, in addition uh, to being approved for the treatment of ADHD, which is a classic prefrontal disorder, um, evidence that it can enhance cognitive remediation in schizotypal patients, and what has been particularly meaningful to me, helping abused or traumatized children. So allowing them to have their prefrontal resilience back online so they can um, better control themselves. Now, a related mechanism is glutamate act, acting at mGlur3, 
which also inhibits cyclic AMP production. So MGLOR3 is a replicated GWAS hit in schizophrenia, and it's associated with cognitive deficit. So we again see the relationship of these to human cognition. In uh, rodents and classic uh, synapses, MGLOR3 are mostly presynaptic. They're also on astrocytes in all species. Uh, but what we find in layer three of dorsolateral prefrontal in primates is that they are predominantly postsynaptic. So we can see them right in the postsynaptic membrane, but especially on the membrane near the spine apparatus. So here's dendrite, spine, neck, the um, synapse, the glutamate axon terminal in pink, the spine apparatus containing calcium, and you can see the MGLOR3 all along there. And MGLOR3 are stimulated not only by glutamate, but by something called NAG, which is co-released with glutamate and is actually one of the most prevalent neurotransmitters in our nervous system, the one that nobody ever knows about, but there it is. And what's so important about NAG is selective for MGLOR3, but doesn't engage the other glutamate receptors. So it's a great research tool. And we see that NAG produces beautiful enhancement of delay cell firing. Now NAG is catabolized um, by an enzyme called GCP2 that's made by astrocytes and is greatly increased with inflammation. And so under conditions of inflammation, we would lose a lot of NAG and lose a lot of MGLOR3 and have less uh, prefrontal firing. And if we inhibit uh, GCP2, we can see a beautiful enhancement of firing uh, by endogenous NAG that has now been allowed to build up. So this seems to be a very powerful mechanism in primates and um, should be an important clue for treatment of cognitive disorders, especially those um, that are associated with inflammation. There was just a paper showing that there's a, a mutation that can cause greater GCP2 expression in humans. And amazingly, it's associated with inefficient prefrontal activity, uh, impaired cognition, and even lower IQ. Uh, so really linking this receptor signaling pathway to human intelligence. So we're now working with a group at Johns Hopkins. Barbara Slusher leads their drug discovery group, um, and they are creating GCP2 inhibitors as potential cognitive enhancers. And we think they might be uh, particularly helpful for treating like brain fog, with um, uh, uh, something like uh, co long COVID, where uh, you have inflammatory state in brain that might be harming uh, prefrontal neurotransmission. So uh, last I wanted to go over the phosphodiesterases. There's A, B, and D uh, in prefrontal cortex, and A and D are particularly interesting because they're the ones anchored near the spine apparatus to control cyclic AMP calcium signaling. So for example, we can see uh, PD4A near ACAP6, which is anchoring PKA, all amongst this, uh, here we have the spine apparatus all through there, the calcium storage. And what anchors PD4s in place and keeps them near the spine apparatus is something called DISC-1, disrupted in schizophrenia. So it's another anchoring protein. Here's the antibody recognizing uh, DISC-1 attached to a large gold particle. And these tiny gold particles are attached to antibodies recognizing PD4A. So you can actually see this one anchoring PD4A in place right next to the spine apparatus. And 
Uh, disc one is of interest because there's a loss of function translocation in a large British family that has very high rates of mental illness where, um, so disc one no longer works in, in um, the affected individuals. And what um, um, it's already been shown, as I said, that it anchors PE4s to the correct location. And what we find is that knockdown of disc one in the rat prefrontal lowers the threshold for stress-induced prefrontal dysfunction, this idea of a gene by environment interaction. So all of this, how does it relate to uh, schizophrenia and this loss of spines in prefrontal? So what we're seeing is that the proteins that regulate and strengthen these dorsolateral prefrontal connections in layer three are all loss of function mutations. So uh, NMDA, MGLUR3, DISC1, whereas proteins that increase cyclic AMP calcium signal and um, weaken connectivity at high levels, such as CAV1.2, VIPR2, HCN1, are gain of function uh, mutations, or in the case of VIPR2, it's actually a duplication of the receptor. And so what this says is that you can have a whole variety of genetic, genetic insults that could produce a similar phenotype of weakened connectivity. And what we're finding evidence of, if you have too much calcium uh, signaling in these spines, it causes calcium overload of mitochondria, which creates mitochondria on a string phenotype. That's how you can actually see um, this abnormal mitochondrial function. And that then produces complement signaling, which signals to glia to remove the spines and dendrites. And C4A, is uh, complement C4A is a, another gene, uh, the one that actually has highest risk uh, for schizophrenia, and that too is gain of function. So how all of these can have the similar function of weakening connectivity and removing these synapses. And the concentration of potassium channels on these spines um, may render these particular layer three uh, synapses, particularly vulnerable to spine loss. Now let me close with Alzheimer's disease and um, especially the relevance to tau pathology and the loss of, um, of neurons, the actual degeneration. So as most of you know, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by these neurofibrillary tangles made of phosphorylated tau and also by amyloid plaques. And what we've discovered recently is that very old rhesus monkeys naturally develop plaques and tangles similar to humans. It is the same qualitative pattern and sequence as humans, um, just much less of it. But what this means is studying the monkey cortex can help us learn what causes the late onset or sporadic, very common form of Alzheimer's disease. So here we see a neurofibrillary tangle in the androvinal cortex of a 38-year-old rhesus monkey and amyloid plaques that look just like humans. So what we're seeing is the proteins that regulate calcium cyclic AMP signaling are lost with age. We lose calbindin, there is some loss of MGLUR3, um, and there is loss of phosphodiesterase as they become unanchored. And this leads to loss of delay-related firing, so um, the neurons can no longer um, keep up this persistent firing over the delay period. We also see evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction, this MOAS phenotype, and evidence of uh, complement signaling, the C1Q, which we think is related to the calcium overload. So this is the complement C1Q 
and one of these abnormal mitochondria in the dendrite. And then we see how um, excessive protein kinase A, calcium signaling, can lead to tau phosphorylation. So for example, um, when you have sufficient calcium uh, to activate calpain, you cleave GSK3 beta, which makes it overactive. Now it can't be inhibited. And that hyperphosphorylates tau. In particular, tau that has been primed by phosphorylation by pKa, um, this primes uh, tau for hyperphosphorylation by GSK3 beta. And so we have a perfect storm here then for driving uh, tau phosphorylation. 202 and 205 phosphorylation are detected by the AT8 um, antibody that is used currently to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And 217 is a new biomarker found in blood that may be used as a new diagnostic, being able to detect Alzheimer's disease very early through just a blood marker. So that's very exciting research out of Sweden. And we can see here uh, 217 uh, tau, oops, excuse me. We see the 217 tau um, uh, aggregating on the microtubules, and we can see um, tau trafficking between neurons, infecting an entire cortical, cortical network, um, in particular the neurons that use high levels of calcium and are involved in higher cognition. And calpain also uh, can activate heat shock protein 70.1, which drives autophagic degeneration, where the neuron actually eats itself from within. We see these autophagic vacuoles, and here you can see evidence of those inside this very old dendrite. So um, the early stages of degeneration and tau pathology. And it's these layer three pyramidal cells that contain high levels of calbindin when people are young that are particularly lost in Alzheimer's disease, linking our work to that in humans. So I hope you can see how that when this genie escapes the bottle, it provides uh, vulnerabilities for all sorts of cognitive disorders. And let me end by thanking the many people who helped to do this work in particular, Min Wang, uh, who leads our physiology group and does uh, a few people in the world who can do this work. She's just extraordinary. And the beautiful EM I showed you um, being done by Konstantinos Pespalis and Divya Deep Data in particular. And we thank um, our many funding sources, the biochemistry done in collaboration with Angus Nairn's lab. Thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Anson, for your wonderful talk. Uh, so we have a couple of um, questions in the chat. Um, and the first most popular question was, what are some methods you would recommend for coping with stress and reducing the brain impact? As a college student, it feels like there's no way to avoid stress. That's right. There is no way to avoid stress, especially as a college student in a pandemic. Um, I think that the way we reduce the toxic effects of stress is very individual. You have to know yourself. What are your limits? What are things that are particularly triggering? And try to limit your exposure to those when you can. On the flip side, what are the things that bring you joy? What are the things that help you feel in control, that restore you, that give you perspective? 
Might it be talking with friends? Might it be playing music, uh, composing, uh, creative things? Um, so finding what, for, for me, I love walking in the woods, uh, the kind of beauty that nature can give. Helping others can really help you, um, many of us, uh, feel more meaning and perspective as well. And being grateful, um, counting our blessings, being forgiving of ourselves. There's um, brain imaging data that when you're feeling forgiveness, when you're feeling um, uh, gratitude, it activates the prefrontal circuits that are involved with suppressing the stress response. So uh, uh, count your blessings uh, is a, a quick way to um, help one sometimes overcome some stress. And then some really, um, the, the kinds of physiological, practical advice, trying to get as much sleep as you can, so limiting screen time so you can really sleep and getting your brain in the habit of sleeping at a particular time. Um, not um, eating junk, um, so the kind of sugar stuff where you um, get a high but then plummet. The prefrontal needs a slow, steady source of, of um, glucose, so healthy snacks throughout the day. Things like alcohol um, can make you feel better um, for a little bit, but they actually make you feel worse and hurt prefrontal the next day. So trying to do things that give you uh, sustained relief rather than the quick fix that leads to things being worse. So, um, uh, and remembering all of us are feeling this way, even if people are acting all together, most people um, are, are feeling the burden of these times. Yeah, thanks for your answer. And um, the next question is, are the pathological findings specific to the PFC that you mentioned in Alzheimer's also seen in frontotemporal dementia or other tauopathies? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So first of all, I should say in Alzheimer's, the um, pathology actually begins in medial temporal lobe in entorhinal cortex. You can see uh, it, the tau pathology begins subcortically, like in the locus ceruleus, but it doesn't proceed as fast. Whereas in layer two of entorhinal and perirhinal cortex, and in entorhinal, it's the grid cells uh, in layer two. Um, this is where uh, the tau pathology proceeds um, uh, quickest, so where you first see cells dying. And then in the um, parental cells of the association cortices and in hippocampus. So even though what I showed you today focused on prefrontal for Alzheimer's, um, uh, the medial temporal lobe is the initial place of pathology. For frontal temporal dementia, there are um, multiple variants, and it seems there that the, the tau pathology, um, our hypothesis is it develops so quickly that it destroys the cell before amyloid can be generated. And uh, depending on the variant, you can have different parts of prefrontal affected in FTD. And the right hemisphere of prefrontal in particular can be very important for inhibiting inappropriate actions, thoughts, emotions. And so if FTD begins there, you can often see a disinhibited profile where the person starts acting very inappropriately. Uh, so the next question is, are there any tools, drugs, or practices scientists know of that increase or improve NDMA or AMPA receptors functioning? Yes, there are. So um, the NMDA receptor complex in particular has um, uh, complex interactions. So there has a, a glycine site that is needed to enhance um, or permit NMDA actions. And deserine is um, um, an endogenous agonist there, as well as glycine and 
there is at least a little bit of evidence that if you eat huge amounts of tea serine, it can enhance that. But I think um, the um, studies I've read, the side effects are such, it, it's very hard to get the tea serine into the brain. And so you're having to eat a whole lot and I don't think it's worth it. Okay, so the next question is, are there any healthy options of activating the acetylcholine receptors? You mean other than smoking, right? Yeah. Yes. No, um, I'll tell you, when I was doing that work, I was like, oh, it makes me want to smoke. But I would really want to smoke uh, just an alpha-7 receptor um, agonist. So, um, and then... Uh, even then, it has to be super low dose because what we see is if you have uh, higher doses, the cell gets too excited and just responds to everything, and then you have cognitive impairment. I don't know of anything that um, allows that kind of specificity, so I'm sorry. We're having to wait for better, better medications uh, to be created. Oh, uh, let me say this. <clears throat> Something you guys are probably already doing, I surely do, is caffeine um, So um, and theophylline. The way um, these agents work is uh, enhances acid, endogenous acetylcholine release. Um, so cholinergic neurons are inhibited by something called adenosine, which builds up over the course of the day and makes us tired and caffeine blocks adenosine receptors and allows us to have more acetylcholine. So um, that is how um, caffeine is helping you have better prefrontal function. Yeah, so the next question is, um, given the PFC specific pathologies you mentioned in Alzheimer's, are there any links between Alzheimer's or dementia and schizophrenia, ADHD, or other PFC-related disorders that show up earlier in life? That's, that's a wonderful question. Um, so um, I think what happens is when people have schizophrenia, they are then they have cognitive deficits um, already early in life, and so um as they get older and their cognitive deficits may be worse um they're they're diagnosed to, with schizophrenia and so then they're not considered to have alzheimer's disease even if um many of the same circuits might be afflicted there's certainly evidence for stress related disorders being a risk factor for alzheimer's disease so stressors in middle age and particularly head injury throughout life is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. For schizophrenia, a major risk factor is um, uh, perinatal uh, insults such as the mother having um, uh, the flu in the second trimester when the brain is developing or perinatal hypoxia so if there are long periods without oxygen during the birth process, and this can be particularly uh, a problem in twin natural births where the placenta starts to separate after or during the birth of the first baby. And so the second born uh, can have um, a higher risk of hypoxia and higher risk of schizophrenia later on. So these inflammatory hypoxic events perinatally are risk factors uh, for later schizophrenia. And I should also say that early life stress, childhood trauma is a risk factor for uh, depression later in life. So the next question is, do monkeys that develop age-related tangle and play pathology also show cognitive symptoms like humans? 
Yes, they do. Um, so they naturally develop cognitive deficits as well as the loss of firing, loss of synapses and plaques and tangles. And um, most monkeys in the wild die by like age 15. We're lucky enough that in the lab where we call the vets the moment, moment any of them have the slightest problem, we've had monkeys uh, living uh, into their 30s. Um, and the, usually um, the very old monkeys, you can um, see um, striking cognitive deficits. Probably not to the same extent as somebody with Alzheimer, really um, prominent Alzheimer's disease, but nonetheless, uh, they are cognitively impaired compared to the young controls. Um, are there any ties between too much PFC activity and epilepsy? Yes. So the prefrontal is not one of the major sites for epilepsy the way the hippocampus is. Um, but whenever you have these circuits where you have recurrent excitation, such as, so in the hippocampal complex, um, you have enterhinal exciting dentate gyrus, which excites CA3, which excites CA1. So if you don't have enough GABAergic inhibition, um, it can be a site for seizures. Here in prefrontal, you have these recurrent excitatory circuits. So you need both the GABAergic inhibition, but also um, these potassium channels help prevent seizures. And so um, families where PKA does not um, open the, the KCNQ channel uh, that is associated with epilepsy. So we have a question from Cecilia Dimino. Um, I'm an educator who works with refugees slash asylum seeking youth. When mental health resources are difficult to find, how effective do you think learning activities that stimulate the PFC or um, precuneus or parietal lobe and work to improve gray matter while also practicing regulating the amygdala might be in alleviating PTSD in adolescents? It'd be wonderful if you could do it. Um, uh, that's certainly the circuitry that you want uh, boosted to help you um, with that. Um, and I, I forgot to say things like meditation um, and mindfulness can also strengthen those circuits. And certainly uh, there are many people who practice that for, for that ability. Uh, right now there are these um, cognitive remediation um, uh, strategies online that people can, can do. And um, I could imagine group therapies might also give that sense of community that can really help people uh, feel more in control. So the next question is, there are studies that argue microdosing methods of psilocybin can help in reducing chances of AD and depression, also and also help in general well-being and mental health. How reliable are these studies? I don't know any on uh, helping Alzheimer's disease. So um, the ones I know about are um, end of life, uh, cancer, um, depression, anxiety, trauma, uh, intractable depression. And it is certainly what is um, one of the uh, areas of, of keen interest right now, but there's very little understanding of how they might work. Um, this was not part of my talk today, but in the medial prefrontal cortex, um, most caudally, there's uh, the subgenual sub cingulate, which is also called Broadman's Area 25, is overactive in depression. <coughs> Excuse me. It has a very rich serotonergic input in the highest level of serotonin transporters um, in the brain, other than the serotonergic neurons themselves. 
So we speculate that both SSRI, serotonin reuptake blockers that are antidepressants, and perhaps these 5-HT2 agonists like psilocybin may act in uh, the subgenual cingulate to um, alter its activity and stop it from activating these stress responses because it has extensive connections to um, activate the stress response uh, throughout the neuroaxis. So that's highly speculative. There's very little uh, data on this, um, but that is uh, where I put my bets. Um, and another question is by Leslie is Salman Zhu is, is there any hope for neuroplasticity reversing any types of dementia in the future? I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of people who have tried that without success. There's evidence that um, those who have higher levels of education throughout life are more resistant to dementia and one idea is that they might have created more connections so that as you lose them, you have more uh, left to rely on. Um, but um, we're really gonna need, um, I think, medications or antibodies that stop the degenerative process. Um, so another popular question was, what research or experiments within neuroscience would you like to do in the future or see done? So one of them I just mentioned there, I think um, studying the subgenual cortex um, and its dependence on serotonin and, and whether it depends on NMDA receptors, because we speculate that ketamine acts there as well. And there's wonderful work out of um, England, Angela Roberts' lab in Marmoset um, that's a beginning to explore these questions. Um, and I think that's a, a really uh, important area. Um, and the prefrontal expands so much from rodents to primates and um, including the medial prefrontal expands and differentiates. So it really is different in a primate. And, and so I think those specific questions will be best answered through uh, work like hers. We're also hoping that we'd be able to create transgenic marmosets and rhesus monkeys to really be able to link um, genetic mutations to changes in circuits and symptoms and to truly have a rational understanding of the neurobiology of cognitive disorders. And of course, what I hope most is that some of these mechanisms that we're um, discovering can be um, places for treatment intervention, for slowing um, or even preventing disorders like schizophrenia and Alzheimer's. Patients with schizophrenia smoke. Do you also see increase of addiction within people who have schizophrenia? Could you repeat that? Because the sound went all funny during that. Oh yeah, sorry. If many patients with schizophrenia smoke, do you also see an increase in addiction within people who have schizophrenia? I um, I think that's um, so. Addiction in general, I I think that um, that I don't know about, and um, I think the smoking and schizophrenia is so viewed as self medication. Um, that it's a little different than people who are doing it for pleasure, um, if they're really doing it to try and um, be more themselves is how that's viewed. I think in general, in teenagers at risk for mental illness, there's much more substance abuse, um, both to try and self-medicate 
um, also to reduce the anxiety, um, the sense of strangeness. Um, and um, that can be harmful when, for example, there's evidence that um, cannabis can actually accelerate descent into schizophrenia for people of some genotype. So um, it, that, that can be um, harmful, not just self-medication. Um, could you elaborate on why acetylcholine release during wakefulness is a basis for conscious thought? Sure, why don't I go back to that? Uh, and it's one of the bases, um, but I think it's a really cool one. So, um, so acetylcholine, when we're awake, would engage these nicotinic and also the muscarinic M1 receptors, depolarize the membrane that would eject the magnesium and allow glutamate to engage these NMDA receptors and have effective neurotransmission. So this cell can talk to this one and then we have conscious thought. In deep sleep, we have no acetylcholine release. This would not be engaged. This membrane would not be electrified. The magnesium would stay in here and this cell, uh, even if releasing glutamate, would not be able to excite this cell. So no neurotransmission under those conditions. I hope that's clear. Um, a really fun thing, acetylcholine is released during REM sleep when we're dreaming. So um, might that be why we're aware of our dreams, although the whole um, fragmentation that occurs because uh, during REM sleep, there's no norepinephrine or serotonin, dopamine. So the difference between waking and dreaming is monoamines. And for the last question we have, why is the neurotransmitter NAG so less studied and what are its other properties? I think it's uh, less studied because people always thought, oh, NAG uh, and MGLUR3, it's just astrocytes. That, um, and we all, um, in our country, um, in, in the United States, astrocytes and glia, oh, those are just support cells. Uh, in Europe, they've always been considered more important. But I think now with this recognition that MCLUR3 are uh, postsynaptic and having this incredibly important role on higher cortical circuits and are associated with uh, in human intelligence and, and uh, with schizophrenia, I hope this area gets much more attention and respect and the realization um, that this quote unquote astrocytic uh, neurotransmitter is really central to our understanding of human intelligence. Thank you so much, Amy, for your intriguing and for your talk. I hope everyone enjoyed as much as we did. And Okay. Now Thanks. Oh, go on. Oh, I just wanted to thank all of you and please feel free to email me any more questions. Amy.arnston at yale.edu. And again, that there's the YouTube videos at the Yale Medical School uh, YouTube channel. So thanks guys, and I'm gonna take off now. Thank you, Amy.